they're heading for Komodo Island in Indonesia. Komodo is an island of mystery, almost mythical, because of its famous residents, the Komodo dragons, the largest lizard on the planet. They can grow three meters long, and the average adult weighs around 75 kilograms. But one hulking fellow tipped the scales at more than 166 kilograms, over 356 pounds. Enough to send chills up your spine when you know what these fearsome predators can do. Komodo is one of the 17,000 islands, large and small, that make up Indonesia. Around 2,000 people live here in wary proximity to one of the most ferocious carnivores on the planet. The rugged island terrain consists of broad mountain valleys, savanna, and arid plains, characteristic Komodo dragon habitat. Surprisingly, scientists didn't officially discover the species until 1910, though we know that they've shared their island with humans for many hundreds of years. The Komodo dragon is part of the Varanid family. It's a carnivore, an ambush hunter, rapidly charging its prey without warning. It can reach a speed of 20 kilometers an hour over short distances when attacking, but it is also a carrion eater ready to chow down on almost any animal carcass. It's even been seen rooting through cemeteries, forcing villagers to move graves to protected areas. The Komodo dragon is perfectly adapted to its environment and can live to the age of 50. It's one of the rare vertebrates that can reproduce by parthenogenesis. Females are able to lay viable eggs without male fertilization. The species is endemic to Indonesia and is found mainly on Komodo, Rincha, and Flores Islands. Komodo dragons are designated vulnerable on the list of endangered species. The population is estimated at between four and 5,000. However, recent surveys recording an abnormally low number of reproductive females have alarmed the scientific community. In 1980, a national park was created for their protection. Park authorities are mandated to protect the territory essential for their survival, as well as ensuring that the Komodo dragons and their human neighbors can safely share the island. Biologists monitor the Komodo dragon populations throughout the vast Indonesian territory. Ahmad and Denny work for a local NGO, and over the years, they've become experts in all things Komodo dragon. Sedna 4 will serve as base camp for the next population census to take place on a number of islands in the sector. Okay, so here we are, the famous Komodo Island, Rinja. Uh, where do you work mainly? We have 10 sites, so we work in Komodo Island, Rincha Island, Nusa Kode Island, is also Gilimatang Island. Islands. Basically what we're doing is, this is a collaboration project between the National Park and our organization. organization. How many people work with your team? Uh, normally we work uh, seven uh, people involved. In this trip we have two visitors from the American Zoo, so one from Los Angeles Zoo, then the other one is from Knoxville Zoo. So because uh, our project is also funded by some zoos in America, so they come here help us and also checking to see, to see the and then see the uh, they also help learn yeah. how to maintain the population here so what do we do this morning uh, we will start to set up a camera, tra camera trap here the main idea is to know whether the dragon present in this area or not let's go then yeah, sure. okay. 
The census covers a huge territory, and the biologists are working with limited means. A number of American specialists have come to lend a hand to their local colleagues. The scientists hope to learn more about the still little understood species. This place is unique. Every time I wake up in the morning and I walk outside, I see something that I've either never seen before or only seen on TV, you know, only read about. It's, it's truly like waking up in Jurassic Park. Akhmad and Denny's work so hard. Their, their work ethic is unparalleled. And I, I feel like they have a really good understanding of what to do to fully understand Komodo dragons. That's the first sight? Yeah, this is our first sight. You use goat all the time or? Always goat, because Always. that's the best. Goat smells really bad yeah. and it's, I think it's the best bait for attracting the dragon. Is there some problem with um, you know, people and livestock like goats. Yeah, sometimes the dragon kill goat that belong to uh, villagers because you know the deer is the main uh, prey for dragon and goat is just almost the same with yeah the deer. So we're take, taking the trial shot just yep. to make the frame is yeah the bait is on frame. Smile. So you use that to for the smell around? Yeah, it's, it's to attract the dragon. The dragon have very good sense of smell. They could smell for up to one kilometer. Awesome. They, call, they have an organ called uh, organ Jacobson, so they, they don't use the nose like us. By the end of the tongue, they, the chemical receptor, and they will transport the chemical they uh, take from the air to the organs. Oh, yeah. It, it's to make sure it's cover all the area. Island, the favorite prey are deer, goats, and water buffalo. But dragons are not picky eaters. They'll eat anything they can sink their teeth into, living or dead. They like to hide and wait for their prey near water, ready to charge the moment an animal lowers its guard. On the exterior, they seem like this otherworldly, you know, um, anachronistic creature that, that still exists on this earth. There was one situation where a dragon had tried to kill a water buffalo, had been unsuccessful, and the buffalo hit it, you know, with its head, threw it into the air, the dragon landed and didn't move for three days, and then finally after three days, picked itself up and walked away. <laughs> so the, just kind of to, to say that they're indestructible in a way. I mean, they just, they, you saw the scars on that individual and they fight and they tear each other up. They drink disgusting brackish water that's probably tainted with all kinds of things and yet they still persist. Overall, they're, they're strong. I mean, they, they can keep going. Biologists have set up a number of motion detector cameras all over the area. The smell of decomposing goat meat attracts the dragons within camera range, and their visit is documented. Ooh. No doubt about the smell. <laughs> <laughs> Forty-three picture. Oh. So. This is last one when we arrived. Mm, this is already dark. Pig? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Boar. It's quite a lot here. Yeah. That data is, is, is taken and we get an idea 
how many, what the, the, the density of the dragon population is. If it's in, ultimately, if we do this every year, we can see if the, if the population is declining or increasing. Okay, we will split become two group. Uh, one group will be responsible uh, on the left hand side, uh, on the left hand side uh, to take three camera trap, uh, and then uh, the other side will be responsible to take two yeah. camera trap. Okay. okay. Denny leads the way. We have to keep our eyes open because dragons are experts at camouflage. Oh, there's a dragon over there. Oh, yeah. Can you see it? Hey. I would say it's probably size for female. It might be one of the dragons uh, which is trapped on the camera trap. Yeah. Danny, the tail still looks fat, so she probably didn't lay this year, huh? Okay. So this is a female? We think it's a female. She's not very big. In fact, she's probably about my height. It's amazing to see how these animals just disappear in the landscape. That's the greatest danger, mistaking one for a tree trunk or a piece of dead wood. You don't want that to happen. Based on her body condition, uh, she probably hasn't laid eggs this year. She's still got a lot of fat store in her tail. Yeah. Um, she looks very healthy. Oftentimes you're walking down the trail and you're not paying close attention. The next thing you know, you're a couple meters away from a yeah. dragon. Beautiful animal. Yeah. Great to see. When hungry, dragons will go for any animal around, including their own young. There is kind of like shift between uh, adult activity and uh, hatchling activity. So in the morning, early in the morning when the, the adult one active, all the baby will be on a tree, just to avoid oh, yeah. uh, cannibalism. Yeah. And then once the big dragon just slug, just because too hot, and then they can go to the ground. Okay. That's what I, we found so far from radio tracking study. Sometimes I would say female also, if if the male can have opportunity, they will kill the, the, the female. Yeah, that's right. That's happened in, in the zoo also. Yeah. 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 Is, is there something that they don't eat? <laughs> Everything that <laughs> vegetable. <laughs> only vegetables. Everything. They are top carnivore here. The Indonesian government and the uh, Indonesian uh, National Park Service protect the dragons very well. It's the poaching, actually, of the prey items, the deer, the Sunda deer. Um, you know, they're a source of food, and without the deer, the Komodos are, would struggle. How are you? How, I'm fine. How I'm are good. you? How are you? Any nice picture? Uh, uh, yes, we, we are going to. Start, okay, we great. just started downloading the images. Great. Yeah. Okay. Have a seat.
It's a big wow. one. Wow, it's a big one. That's a big one. Very big. It's healthy. That's big. Big. <laughs> healthy as well. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so it, this camera is record not only dragon, but any animals, any, that, any movement. More Too big. big. <laughs> Chicken. Uh, chicken. <laughs> jungle fall. Can you do some photo ID with dragon to recognize them? Uh, well, I suppose when weird. they have big scar, but it's yeah. too difficult. It's very difficult. You know, they, there are some researchers use the camera to trying to identify how many dragon individual. individual. Uh, they trying to use the mark recapture method. Yeah. Because it, I think it's only could be done to animal that can be distinguished by the, by the images. Pattern, pattern. Like For example, tiger, tiger yes, and yeah. also the rhino. It's hard to determine the exact number of Komodo dragons scattered over different parts of the island. The motion detector cameras will tell the scientists if there are Komodo dragons in a particular area but the technique doesn't provide any specific information on individuals. If biologists want to follow the development of specific Komodo dragons over time, they have to capture them. A number of dragons have small transmitters implanted under the skin that identify and differentiate them. The catalog of Komodo dragons is a vital source of information on the biology of the species. But in order to access this information, you have to capture individuals. Oh, thank you. <laughs> the whole team meets at the entrance to Komodo National Park. For us, it's a big day. Capturing and handling this dreaded and powerful animal is a real challenge. Everyone is assembled and ready for action. The modular cages will be carried into the heart of dragon habitat. The biologists are confident they'll be able to catch one of the animals tagged in previous captures. So these are the cages used to trap the Komodo dragons. They have just arrived from the village, so we'll take them up to the site. We'll set out bait, and let's hope we manage to trap one. Recapturing dragons is the only way to monitor the development of individual animals. And population monitoring allows biologists to track the animal's health over time and observe the growth of the Komodo dragons in ideal conditions. The National Park is the last peaceful haven for this endangered species. The team will be assisted by staff from the National Park. These park wardens have enormous experience in dragon territory and know how to react in the event of an attack. But no weapons. They defend us using only sturdy forked sticks to push the dragons away. One trap will be set up here. Yeah. Okay. Coming, coming. We are setting the cages up here. There are chunks of goat meat set out, and a male has already picked up the scent and is trying to approach. The guards are trying to control him, so it should not be too hard to trap one. It takes several men to manage this large, hungry male. The smell of the goat meat excites the animal, but the park wardens keep things under control. There are three baits that we put. One is in the pond, yeah. the other one in the middle part, and the other one is uh, tied to the string to the, to, mechanical. Yeah, the mechanical, yeah. so it's activated. So when the dragon came, they will grab the first one, the second one, and when he grabbed the third one, it will be, he can lift the traps and wait the dragon. Oh. Okay. Everything's ready. The signal's being given. 
Now the wardens can get out of the way of the increasingly famished dragon. We've got to be careful not to get bitten because they charge very quickly. It's amazing. They rarely attack humans, but when they do, it's a serious matter. What's the plan? We will open the door? Uh, we will noose first, open yeah. one of the window here, and then uh, pull uh, one by one from the tail, and then hind leg, and then tie the hind leg. After that, pull again, uh, tie the front leg, and then try to measure this dragon. Okay. okay. One, two, three. One, two, three. The animal's strength is tremendous. It's crucial that his powerful feet not touch the ground. He could knock over anyone trying to pin him down if he gets his feet under him. Okay, you can sit there. Yeah, sit there. Okay, yeah, okay. Good. okay. A little bit more. Okay, Ahmad. Pull. They tape the animal's jaws shut to prevent him from using this fearsome weapon. Karung. Okay, sidik lepas. Was sidik lepas? Now we're going to check the dragon whether it's been tagged or not. So we usually put the tag on the right hand leg. So you're going to check it with this thing. With the green. Yep. Yeah, so it's already. Okay. So it's already ID. And I'm going to check. So can help. Yeah. Kosong, kosong, kosong. 643. 58B. So we're going to check the record. Whether it's from this island or from other islands. Just make sure. Yeah, the first time we catch this animal is on 2004, so it's 10 years ago. Okay. What is the weight or the length? Total length, so total body length. Only 10 kilograms. 10 kilograms. Wow. It's still. Now it's. I would say this young. is 60 kilograms. We'll see later. Yeah. We will and see. And yeah. the total length is only 1.8 meters. <laughs> uh, we have to measure the snout vent length okay. because if. A, the total length is important, but just because the dragon is not regenerate their tail, yeah. so this is the, the okay. important one. Can you hold here? Okay, thank you, Zhang. 133.5. Total body length uh, 2.66. 2 uh, pull him. <coughs> Up. Up. Okay, one little moment. One okay. Little moment. One, two, three. <laughs> it's more than 10 kilos, that's for sure. It's 60. 60? 60. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this is a male because usually the female is never weight more than 40 kilograms okay. and never. Uh, had long more than 2.4. 2, so 2.4 2. 4 is the maximum for female. We never found female more than 2.4. So it, we can tell for sure this is a male. And what 
What is the uh, sex re ratio male-female uh, in the wild? Scientists believe that it's the ratio is one female for three males, but we still want to find out whether it's true or not. How long can they live? Uh, for the male, they could live up to 40 years, but uh, when we're trying to estimate the age, some of the male could, some of very healthy animal, the male one can live up to 60, oh, yeah. but mostly they live 40 years old. While the females live shorter than the males, probably they only live for 30 years. This pain is telling us that the dragons already been measured. Yeah. So when the dragons come to the trap again, so we didn't just have to let them go. Tie, just let them go. Uh, okay. First, we untied the legs, uh, but people who handle the legs make sure uh, his leg doesn't uh, touch the ground because once he touch the ground, he will be very strong and, and, and angry. Guys, one, two, three. He's angry. He's angry, eh? Oof. The strength of these animals is incredible. Wow. He's not happy there. This Komodo dragon can now return to the peaceful forest of the park. He's lucky to live in a protected area. Here, hunting is banned. This allows his prey to reproduce and be present in large numbers. When food is abundant, the dragons rarely fight each other. But that's not always the case on other islands where there is less prey and where cannibalism has been observed. Komodo dragons do not live solely in protected parks where human activity is strictly regulated. In some areas, dragons and villagers have to share space, and it isn't always easy. What is the relationship between the villagers and the Komodo dragons? Uh, there is a mythology. Uh, the Komodo dragons actually uh, family with, with the villagers. And also when a dragon trying to came into the village, for example, when they smells food and the people uh, didn't try to harm the dragon, they just pushed the dragon away. We stopped at one of the small isolated villages where people have to interact with Komodo dragons. Age-old myths underlie these shared living arrangements. Nice to meet you. John. John, where are from? Canada. Canada. When I was a little girl, my parents told me a story of a woman who gave birth to twins, one a human, the other a dragon. The dragon ran into the forest. Since that time, we have a blood tie with the dragons, a tie so strong that we are forbidden to kill them. We are not allowed to harm them in any way. The dragons are actually humans with tails. These widespread beliefs provide a level of protection for the dragons. Dragons often attack cats or goats. One came right into my kitchen and ate my cat. Traditionally, all families kept goats. Not anymore, though, 
because they'll just get eaten by dragons. This is where the dragons live. It's their home. And that's just fine because tourists come here to see them. It's fine with me if they attack cats, chickens and goats, but not our children. Goats, cats, dogs, and even chickens regularly fall victim to dragons who prowl the village. Villagers continue to hold the mythical animal in high respect, despite horrifying and sometimes deadly encounters. It was a Friday. The children were all making their way home after a day at the beach. My son was sitting on the stairs. All of a sudden, a dragon leapt on his legs and threw him to the ground. I heard screams and ran to try to rescue him. When I got outside, there was blood everywhere. His belly had been ripped open. When I got there, I screamed, my son is dead. I couldn't believe my eyes. I felt his last breath and I fainted. When I woke up, my child's body looked like the carcass of a dead animal. I'm still grieving. The wound is still there. It's still hard for me to talk about. I was alone walking in the forest. A dragon came up behind me and bit down on my hand. I had a knife, but I didn't use it. I didn't want to hurt it. He's a member of my family. I started kicking him to defend myself. Eventually, some people from the village came to help me. They got me to the hospital. I stayed there for a week. Is it still very painful today? The nerves were damaged. You can see, this is where he grabbed me. When I move my hand, it's still painful. But I have to keep working to survive. Komodo dragons are natural predators designed to kill their prey. That's why they're at the top of the food chain. They've been on the island much longer than humans have. They lived in ecological balance with the other species in their ecosystem before their territory was occupied. For them, hunting for food is essential for their survival. It's also the role they play in nature, their vital function within the great chain of life. When hungry, Komodo dragons hunt with no concept of right and wrong. They don't distinguish between a goat, a deer, or a child. I 
The dragon was 3.5 meters long. The next week, guards came and took him to another island. I can't blame the dragon. It was my son's destiny. That's all there is to it. Every Friday I think about it. I pray that my son is happy where he is. Destiny? Well, maybe. When individual lives are ruled by a society's values and beliefs. In the past, goats were sacrificed as offerings to satisfy the appetite of the predators and ward off attacks. But animal protection groups opposed the practice, declaring it cruel and immoral. So the children have learned to be wary of the Komodo dragons who share their village, their playgrounds, their daily lives. But an ambush can happen anytime. Yet here, it's all put down to destiny. Villagers built a wall to protect the schoolyard. But the school is at the far end of the village, near the mountain, where the dragons lurk. Here, spiritual values, beliefs, and mythology do more to safeguard this endangered species than the concepts of protection and nature conservation. Did you have any uh, incident yourself? Were you uh, bitten by a dragon before? Uh, for this research, we catch almost a thousand individual dragon, and one dragon can uh, there several times, so it's almost more than 2,000 captures, and there's no accident. That is something that we're always proud of. Yes, of course. I think as long as we respect wild animal as wild animal, it won't become a big problem. So yeah. we can learn how to catch the dragon, save for the dragon, and then also Safe for researcher. researcher also. But in reality, there's no safety for this endangered species. I would say their biggest threat would be any kind of loss of interest. Um, you know, this, this park is good and it's, it's stable right now, but I would say if people tend to stop being interested for whatever reason, I worry that they may not protect them as well as they should. They may not be as vigilant in, in protecting them, and, and that could be a problem. Like so many species that are, that, are, that are threatened or endangered, it's habitat destruction. With the introduction of, of invasive species comes also disease. And you're talking about a population of, of animals here that's probably less than 5,000 individuals. That's not too many animals. So uh, if a disease you know, was introduced to the islands, they could quickly be wiped out. Despite the many threats to its precarious existence, no one wants to see this extraordinary carnivore disappear. The Komodo dragon represents much more than a formidable predator within an ecosystem. Here, it's considered a full member of the family of living beings. Only time will tell if these traditions can spare the largest dragon on the planet from extinction.
we headed to the Cayman Islands in the Caribbean Sea. The archipelago consists of three main islands, Grand Cayman, Little Cayman, and Cayman Brac. Tourists and foreigners come here mainly because of the great beaches and the scuba diving conditions that make this place one of the best diving sites in the world. Located south of Cuba and northwest of Jamaica, the Cayman Islands have an impressive marine biodiversity. On land, the population explosion on the island of Grand Cayman has reduced critical habitat for species that are threatened with extinction. This is the case of the blue iguana, an endemic species which is considered one of the rarest animals on the planet. It can measure up to 1.5 meters in length and weigh up to 14 kilos. The blue iguana can live close to 70 years, but it still has to survive in its habitat. In the 2000s, there were few more than a dozen animals in the wild. But the biologist Fred Burton has made it his mission to save them from extinction. A daunting task for a reptile that scientists have classified as extinct in the wild. On Little Cayman, other conservation issues face the residents of the small island. Here, biodiversity issues are not apparent, but an invader has taken up residence in the pristine waters around the island. And since the islanders depend on tourism and diving, well, they are worried. Thank you. In the early 1990s, a few aquarium fish were accidentally released into the sea in Florida. Native to the Indo-Pacific, they began to reproduce and populate the Caribbean. This invader, which now threatens the age-old balance of the coral reefs, is called the lionfish. In less than 20 years, this species has really caused incredible havoc. One lionfish living on a coral reef can reduce the population of other small fish from 80 to 90 percent. The decline of the ocean's large predators, combined with the uncontrolled spread of the lionfish, is a recipe for disaster. If nothing is done to control the invasion, the tourism sector of the Cayman's economy is in serious danger. The professional divers of Little Cayman have watched as the lionfish spread throughout the island's waters. Now these dive guides organize a weekly lionfish hunt to try to control the dramatic expansion of the species. The first lionfish was discovered in Little Cayman in about 2008, here on the south side of the island. And um, it was just one lonesome fish, and uh, it was quickly discovered, and we went out there and grabbed it. And then we didn't see any fish for quite some time, um, possibly about, about six months. And then we started to see not just one, we started to see more than one popping up on different reefs. And that number just quickly escalated into tens and then into many, many, many fish. It took just a few aquarium fish to cause one of the worst environmental disasters in modern times. The lionfish invasion continues to spread and now extends far beyond the Caribbean. Genetically, in fact, scientists speculate that these fish could have come from common ancestors, the few creatures released off the coast of Florida. That's all it takes to upset the millennial balance of an ecosystem. They eat a lot, pulled uh, stomachs out of fish and seen a large amount of fish and crustaceans, everything in their belly, seen them hunt fish actively on the reef and they just don't stop. They have a foreign predation strategy, which means the fish here don't recognize it as a, as a predator. They've got these really big uh, you know, pectoral fins and what they'll do is they'll sort of herd a fish towards the reef, right? And um, then they do something that's very unique. 
and what they do is they start to blow water out of their mouth towards the prey. And what they basically do is they point themselves right, right at the lionfish and then the lionfish just sucks it in. This whole island relies on dive tourism and we are the ambassadors to this environment so it has sort of fallen down onto our hands to, to look after the environment. The people of Little Cayman are worried because they depend on tourism. The spectacular beauty of the coral reefs and their colorful fish attract divers here from all over the world. Each week, the population is mobilized. A squad of professional divers set out to hunt for lionfish. Their goal, kill as many as possible. Attempt to control the invasion so that other species of fish can continue to grow on the coral reefs. The latest uh, uh, scientific study that's been completed this year in 2011 shows that to have the, um, an impact on lionfish, um, you have to have a large concentrated effort on a small area to be effective. The industry that we're trying to protect services the Bloody Bay Marine Park, which is a small area of only about three miles long. So we have a high concentrated effort that uh, we're putting into that Bloody Bay area to try and keep our marine park relatively free of lionfish so that we can maintain the biodiversity within the marine park. All right, we're going to Penguin's Leap. It's up on the north side. It's way past CCMI. So it's going to take us about 30 minutes to get there probably. Good. Okay. Great. We have lionfish, as well as the rest of the Caribbean has lionfish, and they've just invaded all of the Caribbean, and there's going to be no difference from diving here in Little Cayman or in, uh, in Cancun or in uh, Belize or anywhere else in the world. Um, so I think it's going to be very important that we continue killing these animals, and that's the only thing that's going to keep this special spot different than uh, the whole rest of the Caribbean. Marine Park, we've done a really good job of eliminating a lot of lionfish to the point where we don't see them on a daily basis anymore. It's very good, but there's still lots of other parts of the island we don't get to. It's what we're going to get to right now, where there are still lots of lionfish that need to be uh, removed. So hopefully we'll have a big, uh, a big turnout tonight. That they have, or they put tuna. Even though the boat seems very busy, it's you know we've, we've virtually got everyone that's left on the island to come out today to come and call. Um, you know, with most of the divers, uh, dive masters being away uh, for our shutdown during the hurricane season, um, you know, it's very important for us to keep culling all the time. Um, whether it be inside the marine park or outside, wherever we get the opportunity to go, we have to go no matter what. Well, best case scenario, we're hopefully going to have a big catch. Uh, we've got uh, uh, 16 people in the water with 14 spears. So 14 spears, we're hoping for a fairly big number, maybe above 80. We're always hoping for 100. We, we have had uh, days over 100. So we're always hoping for a big catch. The efforts of the divers were successful, but despite their success, 
It is work that has to be repeated constantly, because the reproductive rate of the species is very impressive. And if the effort is relaxed, the invaders will continue to eat all the other small fish, and there will be a complete degradation of the coral reef. Seventy-five. You know, that seventy-five fish, if you average it out to twenty fish per day that they're eating, that's seventy-five times twenty is how many fish got eaten within the last twenty-four hours. That's a lot of fish. That's a huge amount of fish. The work of biologist Fred Burton on Grand Cayman is truly inspiring. With a small team, he tries to reintroduce a natural species, the blue iguana, which many biologists already consider extinct in the wild. So what do we have here? So these are the, uh, these are the original things. I always knew I wanted to get involved in conservation in some way, shape or form. Even for a small child, I was crazy about that kind of stuff. In Europe, it's very unusual to find a an ecosystem which has not been influenced at all by humans. And here it was everywhere. And it was a very exciting thing for me to be, to be seeing these things. And that was the time that I started getting involved with these crazy giant blue lizards. Um, the first time I met one, I had no idea that these things existed. In 2002, we did a very detailed survey, and it was the most depressing survey I have ever been involved in, because all of the places we used to see iguanas, there were none. Optimistically, there cannot have been more than 12 left in the wild, and they weren't finding each other to breed. So the population was doomed. It was functionally extinct, as, the, as we put it, technically speaking. They were there, but there was no future. And this was shocking to us, because we thought we had time, and no, no, we didn't have any time at all. Fred Burton's task was enormous. In fact, there were only a few creatures left in the wild, and many biologists thought that Fred was something of a dreamer, that the task was too daunting for a single person. He patiently tracked down a few wild animals and began a breeding program. Today, the Botanic Park on Grand Cayman is home to the last blue iguanas on Earth, and the captive bred population is healthy. So this is the captive facility, Jean. Yep. We have about 300 iguanas here. Um, yeah, here is, here is one. Uh -huh. This is, uh, we call this one Juan Lins. Uh, he's one of our founder males. These are, these are the original wild origin animals that we are using to represent the genetics of the original population. They grow up to 10 kilograms or maybe a lot more um, occasionally. Rare dominant males can get quite giant. They're vegetarians. They eat almost exclusively plant matter. They eat leaves, flowers, berries, fungi sometimes. Um, they're very intelligent. They quite clearly are able to think ahead, make a strategy, and then carry out that strategy. We've watched this um, with mating strategies of the male iguanas, and it's very complex, their behavior. They, they're, they're, not, um, they're not dumb creatures by any stretch of the imagination. It all started here, in a small incubator in Fred's house. If we'd uh, left these things in the ground, it would be 50-50 whether they would hatch successfully or not, because uh, the ground could get dry, it could rain really heavily, the pens could flood. So it's much, much safer to take the eggs out, put them in the incubator here, and here we have better than a 90% hatch rate. It's a, it's a very secure kind of way of making sure we get as many baby blue iguanas as we can from those nests. When they hatch, they're tiny, they're about this long, um, but they grow very, very fast. And by the time they're two years old, they're naturally predator-proof, effectively. They get too big for the native snakes. Jean, these are the cages where we have the two-year-old iguanas, the, okay. ones, uh, the ones that we're getting ready to release into the wild. 
scan. Eight six 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 one. Correct. Correct. All right. Good. Let's get it in a bag. So it will sleep there for tonight. Yes, we'll we'll keep them in these bags. We'll hang the bags inside our backpacks, ready to take in the morning, and they will cool down tonight, and they'll be very peaceful and. Fred Burton's great challenge now is to reintroduce the species in nature. His successes, but also his difficulties, have become famous around the world, which was what convinced the government of the Cayman Islands to set up a protected area where he can release the young animals in the wild. But getting to the protected area is no easy task. We have to walk for hours in sweltering heat on paths with razor-sharp rocks, not to mention the poisonous plants, cactus spines, and snakes. John, we are on the boundary now of uh, the Collier's Wilderness Reserve. This okay. is the protected area on, on our left now. How big it is? It's, um, it's about 190 acres. That's uh, around about a, roughly, very, very roughly a square kilometre. It's not huge, but the island isn't big, yeah? Yeah. Rough trail, but beautiful. Yeah, I love this environment. I think it's it's like a, it's like a natural rock garden. Yeah. yeah. In 2008, we had a a disaster. Some drug crazed guy and a and a, and a tame dog, a attack dog on a leash, came into the captive facility here, and killed um, six, seven, eight uh, blue iguanas. It was like a slaughter. It was crazy. And the news got onto that and it just went like boof all over the world. But what was interesting is as soon as it went public, the population of the Cayman Islands got up in arms. There were people raising money for us. Companies wanted to pay for a security fence around the captive facility. It was in the newspapers nonstop for two weeks here. It was the disaster and the media coverage that made the politicians of the time pay attention a little. So what I thought was, OK, let's make the world care about blue iguanas. And then we can tell the world if the blue iguana is going to survive, we must protect some of their habitat. It took a long time to work, but it, it is working now. At last, it is working. This is our little uh, home from home in the woods, yeah? Oh, sweet home. This is where, uh, this is where our volunteers sleep when, uh, oh, when, yeah. when we have them camping out here. This is Larko. <laughs> wow. He's here to meet us. I didn't know if we'd see him today. That's a, cool a creature, big eh? one. Yeah. This is the dominant male in this area. Um, he's, uh, he's the biggest land animal around, so uh, he's not afraid of us. He's not afraid of anybody. He was born, I think, in 1998, and we released him in 2001 in the Botanic Park. And he lived there very happily for a number of years, and then he got very big. <laughs> and some of the people who visited got a little bit afraid of him. And uh, <laughs> it got to a point where it's, well, maybe he'd be better out in the wilderness. So we brought him out here and released him with some females. His, his objective is to have exclusive control of as many different female territories as he can. <laughs> <laughs> I hatched this guy from an egg in an incubator. We reared him for three years, I think, in, in, in the cages in the captive facility. We released him in the botanic park, and then he became the guy who just hung around in our captive facility there. So we got to know him very well, and then, uh, and then we had to move him out here. So this, this is an old friend of mine. Yeah. yeah, he knows me. 
we have now 20 different unrelated wild iguanas. And that's good, that's yeah. enough to, uh, to give us the genetic diversity that's necessary. On Little Cayman, another expedition is being organized. This time it's Sedna 4 that will serve as a platform to reach a shoal called Pickle Bank, south of Cuba. Researchers have wanted to come here for a long time. It's hard to get to, so local fishermen probably don't use it much. Scientists hope to find large fish like groupers and sharks here and determine whether the explosion of lionfish populations is slowed by the presence of large predators. Hey. Hi. Hi. I'm Savannah. Hi, Savannah. Such a nice to meet, to meet you. Katie, so nice to meet you. Hi. Hey, man. Hey, How are you? Nice to see you, man. Yeah. Hi, Mike. Mike. John. Nice, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Hi, Mariano. Savannah is ready, so we should probably get things uh, ready and leave right now. Thanks Good first. Trip. Thanks first, yes. 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 Okay, here we are, Little Cayman, and here the famous Pickle Bank, where we'll be heading in pretty soon, actually. So what do you expect to find there? We're expecting to see lionfish, but we're not sure what uh, the population density will be. There may be a high, high population density, there may be a low population density, but we're going to go and find out. And that's why it's so important for us to go there, is because nobody knows what it's going to be like there. And it's so important, you know, and it's so great to have the Sedna as this jumping off platform for us to really get out there and collect some data about a place that there is no data. Do you think that because it's far away uh, and that's a place where the human impact is, you know, lesser than here, uh, do you think that we should find less lionfish than here? Here on Little Cayman, we put a lot of effort into, you know, culling the lionfish off the reefs, getting them out of out of the environment. And at Pickle Bank, there's nobody removing them, so it could be that we drop down there and we find an explosive population of lionfish because there's there's been no human uh, mediated removal of lionfish. But then what Neil was saying, um, the other side of it is that it could be that we also haven't fished out the other large predators that would be either competing with or preying upon the lionfish. So it could be that we go there and we find a lot of these large-bodied groupers of the larger predators and then we find a low biomass of lionfish. So there's two opposites of the spectrum that we can see and we don't know which one it's going to be yet. It takes us two days to get to Pickle Bank. And then we have to fight with the wind and waves in the middle of the ocean to get our inflatable boat into the water. We're going to do a dive today. It's a, an underground seamount. It doesn't reach all the way to the surface. So it's an area that uh, usually people do not go to. And hopefully we're going to be able to uh, correlate it to the reefs back in Little Cayman and see how that differs. Once arrived there, it was really strange for us because we could anchor the Sedna 4 right in the middle of the ocean. Normally it would be too deep, but as we were on a shoal, a kind of underwater mountain, we were able to anchor. On the other hand, these conditions create currents, so we will have to be very careful during the dives because for the divers, it could get tricky. We really hope that we come up with something that uh, we can share with the rest of the scientific community about an area in the Caribbean that's very data deficient, unexplored, and 
even if we can't find a high density of groupers like we were hoping for, we hope we can still bring some light to what's going on here on the Seamount Pickle Bank. Two hundred and fifty feet, stand by. One hundred feet. Fifty feet. We're on site now. Sedna 4, Sedna 4, Musculus, Musculus, 906, 906, Divers in Water. When we jump in, we don't actually know what we're going to find until we get down there. And that presents challenges for us because we can start, you know, doing the science and then all of a sudden find out that the wall drops away from us and we just find ourselves too deep. Our transects are 100 meters long by 3 meters wide. What we're recording are um, the species and sizes of um, large-bodied predatory groupers as well as um, the invasive lionfish. Seeing large fish like groupers is already a good sign. Twenty-five point six meters. We are really on the wall, and if I move a bit, we'll see it going down, down, down. And whoops, it's gone. It's very deep. And as soon as I shift a bit on the wall, we're back to depths ranging between 23 and 26 meters. What we have is the Caribbean Sea, so there's a lot of fish, a lot of life. What we want to check, of course, is whether or not there are lionfish here. The invader has managed to establish itself here. But there are many more large fish here than around Little Cayman. That is good news. Mike has a yellow buoy, and that's what really helps me to follow them in the wave, because with just bubbles, it would be extremely difficult not to lose track of them. So I always look out for his yellow buoy. That really allows me to know where they are. Sedna 4, Sedna 4, Musculus, Musculus. 
it was really fantastic that we were able to find this reef system that had a lot of groupers and not so many lionfish. Uh, it, we didn't really know what to expect going down, going in here, and although all the data hasn't been completely analyzed and we don't want to draw any conclusions too soon, it is very encouraging to see a large biomass of groupers with a small biomass of lionfish and a lot of uh, the intact healthy small fish. I just keep thinking how few people have been fortunate enough to be here and do this type of thing, you know? It would be impossible to do this without, without the Sedna. It would be impossible. You have to have a staging platform like the Sedna. You have to. It's a very pristine reef and it makes it, next to the science, also very interesting for us to dive. It's a little extra benefit. <laughs> we saw less lionfish on this dive than what we expected. And uh, it can just be because of the time of day. You know, it's maybe good news also. You know, mm -hmm. it, there's less lionfish and big fish. That means that maybe the ecosystem can balance, you know, the invasion. But, you know, that's, that's a big, big part. That's you know. a big question. Yeah. We don't know. I've done most of my diving in Little Cayman, which is generally considered to be a quite healthy reef, but there were way more fish at Pickle Bank, and there was pretty good coral cover. We, we did see some coral disease, some coral bleaching, but not too much. Um, I also, I was struck by the amount of algal cover that was there as well as the coral cover. And it could be just, you know, it's the summertime and so the algae is in its peak growth season. I wouldn't say that it was al algae dominated reef. I thought that there was a, overall a very good balance at Pickle Bank for sure. For several days, we continued to dive at Pickle Bank. It's probably too early to draw conclusions, but the research has generated a lot of hope because we learned that those places that have not yet been fished still contain many large fish, large predators such as groupers or sharks. The lionfish is already established, but we wonder if the natural health of the ecosystem might not succeed in controlling the invasion of this alien species. It's still too early to draw that conclusion, but this expedition does produce a certain amount of hope. I think we really need environmental success stories. The work of Fred Burton is inspiring, but there are still many, many more steps to take. We wonder if the iguanas that breed well in captivity will succeed in doing so in the wild, for example. And will the protected habitats be enough to repopulate Grand Cayman? All of the forces which drove them to the point of extinction are still operating. The population of the Cayman Islands is doubling every 12 years. What that means is the footprint on the land here that's taken over by humans is doubling every 12 years. And what that means is that the dogs and cats that people like to have around them will be at the boundaries of these protected areas. And cats, feral cats particularly, go wild in this island very easily. And they eat, hunt and eat baby blue iguanas. And all sorts of other wildlife as well. But they're a huge threat to the iguanas. As the island becomes more and more urbanized, um, we have more and more fast traffic. And roadkill is becoming one of the big, big, big problems that we have to deal with. So we are going to have to secure the boundaries of these protected areas. We're going to have to put up some sort of a barrier that will prevent dogs and cats from getting in and will prevent the iguanas from getting out because if they leave, they will get getting into harm's way. Jean, we will get rid of our packs here and, yep. uh, and we'll just take the iguana in. Matt, I think this one's in yours, yeah? Yeah. yeah. There you go. Okay, so that's 575. 75. Good, so we're in here. Okay, here's the box. So 
So now this uh, this little iguana, Jean, is a very confused animal, and uh, he's wriggling around in here. But once we get him out, we need to give him a minute to to get used to his environment. Hey? So here he is. So these beads, uh, the small pale blue, the red, the big blue, this is um, just a, an arbitrary colour combination that is unique to this animal. So any time I see these beads, I know that this is this animal. And, oh yes. <laughs> Whoa! So now he will spend all night inside this box. But then all the stress of today's walk will be gone and this will be the safe place that he, he, he stays close to. And probably for one month, he won't go more than two meters away from this box. Okay, next. And the population has gone from about 12 now to about 650, 700, somewhere around there. It's very important, I think, for people working in conservation to spend at least part of their time working on things that can succeed. Um, it's important for personal motivation, um, but it's also important for the way that conservation is presented to the world. People get very tired of hearing bad news stories all the time. First, the first wild-born young iguana we have ever seen in this area. That would be like Zarko's baby for sure, yeah? So um, it is working. It's working. It's great. Working. <laughs> so spreading the news? Yep. I'm just texting John Morot to let him know that we've got, we got wild ones running around out here already. It's a great day. It's cool. It's really good to see it. I got a text from Fred and uh, the text said, uh, just saw the first hatchling in the new reserve. Uh, breeding is, is successful out here. And that just made my day. Zarko had a big love affair with, uh, with Juanita and the other female we released with him. And I bet you anything, this is Juanita's baby and Zarko is the, uh, is the, is the father. I played a part in establishing this botanic park. I played a part in so many things here. Um, it's important and it makes you feel that you've done something for the planet. It doesn't cancel out all of the rest that's going on, but at least it's, you know, it's my part. Eliminating the lionfish from the Caribbean is a huge challenge. Everyone knows that this invasive species is here for good. But how do we control it? We need a natural solution, because we can't catch all the lionfish in the oceans. Neil and his fellow divers have developed a special relationship with groupers around Little Cayman. They are training them to eat lionfish. This solution probably won't work on a large scale. And who knows if the groupers will develop a taste for lionfish. But the initiative is an excellent demonstration of citizen mobilization to stop the spread of the invader.
but the lionfish is also feared by local fishermen. According to an urban legend, the lionfish is deadly. There's a lot of uh, myths surrounding this fish that this fish is poisonous. It is not poisonous. It is, in fact, venomous. These dorsal fins are the venomous ones, and it's not actually the spike itself that is venomous. This, uh, that, that there is just the delivery mechanism. What is venomous is actually inside the soft tissue here, and as the spine enters the body, it pushes the soft tissue back, which compresses the soft tissue, and that releases the protein-based venom, which travels up through tiny little grooves alongside the spine. And, and that is how, once the spine enters your body, that uh, the venom can then enter your body as well. So something that I think is, is important to point out is that this is the liver of the fish. And what's interesting to note that this liver is very large. It's because these fish, which are wild fish, are suffering from a disease called fatty liver disease which is not a fish, uh, it's not a disease that a wild fish suffer from. This is a, a, a disease that aquarium fish suffer from. So why are these wild fish suffering from fatty liver disease? And it's because they're eating too much. They eat pretty much anything they want. They're indiscriminate predators. And because of that, they're growing too fast and they now have fatty liver disease. Another way of stopping the spread of the lionfish may be to eat it. The flesh of this fish is exquisite, and governments are trying to convince restaurants and consumers to put lionfish on the menu. Oh, that's great. That's great. A consumer market for lionfish would put even more pressure on the species. But it's a challenge, because local fishermen fear the venomous spines of the lionfish. And yet, it's delicious. Toast to a permanent lionfish culling solution. Here's the, here's. the Caymans, like many islands of the Caribbean, face big challenges. On land, urban development weakens and reduces critical habitats for many species. At sea, the invasion of alien species such as lionfish now threatens the entire balance of marine ecosystems. Citizen involvement is important, and the colossal work of Fred Burton should serve as an inspiration. These scientists dedicate their lives to the preservation of biodiversity, and we must never forget that it is this biodiversity that allows our own species to survive on this planet as well.